today we commemorate the liberation of the Netherlands. And so I think at the end of our semester, it's most appropriate that we look again at the reason this lecture series was created 33 years ago, the Holocaust. And for that, we have the ideal speaker, Hans Lukas. Hans was born in Berlin on April 14, 1928, to Ernst and Henny, and had two older brothers, Tom and Frank. Fred, I'm sorry. Hans's family was what he describes as a typical upper class, upper middle class German Jewish family. His father was a banker and his mother a homemaker. Hans survived the war in Amsterdam, in hiding for 18 months with the family employed. His mother Henny and his older brother Fred also survived in hiding. His oldest brother, Tom, had emigrated to the United States in 1939 and he served as an interrogator of prisoners of war in the 87th Airborne Division. His father, Ernst, perished in Auschwitz. Hans is one of the pillars of this lecture series, and he is also one of the most highly regarded members of our alliance for the study of the Holocaust and genocide. It's important that his story and his message reach as broad an audience as possible. Hans has dedicated himself to that quest. He speaks here and in many classrooms and meeting halls in Sonoma County, in California, and across the nation. <laughs> we all know how valuable Hans' dedication to preserving this memory is, and I am very pleased that today you'll have a chance to understand why it is so important. Please welcome Hans on. Thank you, Professor Parnes, for this very kind introduction. I feel honored to be asked again this year to tell my experiences about growing up Jewish during the Nazi period in Germany and in Holland, and to share with you what it felt like to be considered a surplus human being doomed to be eliminated, and how my mother, my brother, Fred, and I managed to survive. I will focus on my own experience, on that of my oldest brother, Tom, who was eight years older than I, and who had experienced Germany for 13 years before Hitler, uh, came, before Hitler came to power. I will touch briefly on Dr. Bruno Kitt, who selected my father to be killed in Auschwitz. I want to give you a bit of history to put things into perspective, even though most of you probably are aware of these facts. Germany had lost World War I, which it had started, and was in terrible financial shape. There was a worldwide economic depression, and Germany had to pay reparation to the victors of World War, II, World War I. There was huge unemployment, and along came Hitler, uh, and promised the uh, moon, and the Germans went for it. The Nazi leadership was convinced that Germanic, so-called Aryan, white, blonde, blue-eyed people, were superior to all others and deserved to rule not only Germany but the entire world. They especially hated the Jews, but also many others, like the Gypsies, whom we now call Romanos, gay people, Jehovah's Witnesses, because they refused to swear allegiance to Hitler, the Slavic Eastern European people, people with uh, mental and physical disabilities, and many others, all of whom they deemed surplus people not worthy of living. Initially, the Nazis tried to get rid of the Jews by making it impossible for them to earn a living in Germany, thereby encouraging them to leave the country. That is how about half the German Jewish population survived by leaving. Uh, this is sort of the cast of characters. Uh, uh, this is my mother. 
without her efforts, I would not have made it. This is my father who perished in Auschwitz, my brother Fred, who also was in hiding, and my brother Tom in his 82nd outfit. Hitler was a narcissist, if ever there was one. It was all about him. I consider him an evil, unfortunately very intelligent maniac. That is why he does not bother me as much as the German population who adoring, adoringly uh, went along with him. After this introduction, I will share with you what it was like for me growing up Jewish in Nazi Germany. My first experience really was when I started school in 1934, one year after, uh, after Hitler came to power. I was six years old at the time and was enrolled in a uh, regular uh, public school. Uh, this one was for boys. My class existed of 52 boys and I was the only Jewish kid in there. The cone that I'm holding here was traditional, filled with goodies, uh, symbolizing a sweet year ahead. Well, it didn't turn out so sweet for me. <clears throat> I was uh, placed in the back of the room, a little bit separate from the other kids, as if I had a contagious disease. Uh, now, the kids were not nasty to me, uh, my fellow students. Uh, they didn't call me dirty Jew or spit in my face or did any of that sort. They simply wouldn't interact with me. I have reason to believe that most of the parents were not Nazis. Uh, in Berlin, Hitler never got the majority vote. And... Uh, but you didn't want to be called Jew, Jew lovers either. So the parents probably just told their kids, leave that angry kid alone. And so they did. For instance, in the morning when we had assembly around the flagpole and they joined, raised the uh, first the German flag, red, white, and uh, black, uh, white, and red, and sang the German national anthem, and then they hoisted the swastika and sang the, uh, the uh, Nazi uh, song, all the while standing at salute. I was not allowed to sing nor raise my hand for salute, neither one of which I, wa I certainly wanted to do, uh, but I certainly stood out like a sore thumb. So that first year in school was uh, pretty lonely. Um, we moved, and, and uh, my parents enrolled me then into a Jewish school, which was in, within walking distance of our new home. But before we moved, we lived on a busy street, uh, which led to the suburb, suburbs. And on Sunday morning, my brother Fred and I liked to sit in front of this window on my father's desk, uh, chewing on uh, stale uh, ends of bread, which the uh, maid served for, uh, saved for us, <clears throat> and watched the goings on down below. And besides the cars and the street cars and uh, bicycles that came by, there were the brown shirts marching down the street, singing, Wenn das Judenblut vom Messer spritzt, dann geht noch mal so gut. When the Jewish blood squirts off the knife, things go twice as well. Well, you can imagine that that song was a little bit disturbing for me, and I uh, asked my parents, what is that all about? And they tried to reassure me and said, uh, well, don't worry about that. That's their problem, not yours. Well, it certainly turned out to be my problem. So after we moved from here, I was enrolled in the Jewish school, the Jose, uh, 
Josef Lehmann Schule. And in 1936, uh, were the Berlin Olympics, and the Jewish schools in Berlin decided their, uh, to have their own mini Olympics. And I was too young to uh, participate, but I was chosen to carry their sign of the school. My brother, uh, Mark Stombier, in between, he is not in this picture, but he got a first. Uh, for the high jump and a, a second for the 100 meter dash. Keep this picture in mind because it comes back later on. Uh, our life more, was more or less normal, I mean, we didn't have to wear the star yet, and uh, uh, while they were not, it was before the uh, uh, Kristallnacht, so it was reasonably still normal in Berlin, but you were well aware that you were living in a hostile environment. There were cartoons all over the city, plastered uh, of Jews drinking uh, Christian blood, and uh, uh, there were signs, uh, Jews not allowed in certain stores. So it, it, it was not a pleasant environment, but uh, we were also not terribly restricted at the time yet. In 1937, my father uh, read in the newspaper that Jews were not allowed to be bankers anymore. And since this was... Uh, all he knew, and it was obvious that Jews had no uh, future in Germany, he decided uh, for us to leave. And while Jews were encouraged to leave, they were supposed to pay a fleeing tax, a tax to be allowed to leave the country, which amounted to almost all the life's earning of people. And my father had the responsibility of a family of five, and he was not about to leave his money behind. So he engaged a young uh, Dutch woman, uh, a German woman, uh, who had a suitcase with a double bottom. And so uh, his lifelong earnings were in that suitcase. And she traveled with it to Holland and made it all right and probably got about 10% of whatever it was she had carried. In the meantime, my mother, my brother Fred and I left by train for, to Holland and then from Holland uh, went on to London. We had a visitor's visa to England. We could stay there for four months. Um, on the, uh, while we were packing up in Berlin, I was told we were going on vacation. Uh, but it was obvious to me that there was much more going on. Uh, there were lots of things that were being packed that one doesn't take a long vacation. Anyhow, once we were on the ship to England, my mother told me that, no, this is not a vacation. You have left Germany forever, and you will probably never see any of your friends again, which turned out to be true. In the meantime, my father... And my brother were planning to take a plane to Amsterdam from Berlin. And when they came to the airport, the plane was canceled. Um, fortunately, they decided not to uh, travel in the same direction. My father traveled to uh, Czechoslovakia by train. And at night, uh, the station was right on the border. He crossed the border. And that was a good thing because the fam uh, some of the people that were left behind where we, when we left the country uh, wanted to basically cover their butts and inform the German authorities that we had left. So the Germans started leaving. They thought we were out of the country. 
three of us were, two of them were. My brother took a train to Holland, my oldest brother, Tom. And when he came to the border, they looked at his passport and said, Angus, Angus, where are your parents? And he said, well, they're in Berlin. And he let him go because he was looking for Angus, a family of five. And, uh, well, sometimes you have to have luck in life. When we were all in London, we, my parents tried desperately to get either to the United States or to Brazil or to anywhere across the ocean. And it all would have taken forever. Uh, there was a possibility to get to uh, Brazil, but the Brazilian government at the time would not accept German Jews anymore. In order to go there, we would have to become Catholics. And my father, who was the ethical one, absolutely refused. Uh, my mother's attitude, who was a survivor, and his attitude was, whatever it takes, that's three drops of water, what do you care? But my father prevailed, and ultimately, uh, we made the uh, fatal mistake of going back to Holland, which was one of the few countries still accepting German Jewish uh, immigrants. And he uh, joined up with a uh, man who had uh, he partnered with a person who had a vast experience in textiles. And we started a store in Amsterdam, uh, Mayfair, uh, lingerie and stockings. And it was a great success. And after one year, we started the second store in The Hague. And um, a third one was planned. And my brother Fred was supposed to manage that one, but that never came to be. Um, so I had two wonderful years in Holland. And um, my father enrolled me in a school where German Jewish kids were supposed to learn Dutch. So the teachers did all they could. But here were 30 kids, all Germans. And among ourselves, we, of course, kept on speaking German uh, because that's what came naturally. And I felt I didn't make progress fast enough and convinced my father to enroll me in a Dutch school and let me sink or swim. And so I ended up in a Dutch school with uh, a dictionary under my arm and managed to get B's and C's. And my parents were happy with that, and so was I. Uh, this was an outing of that school. I think it was the fifth grade, yes. And here you see me holding a goat together with my fifth grade girlfriend, Hedda. And the people from uh, Mercy High who put this PowerPoint presentation together for me decided to have some fun with it and blew it up. <laughs> and this is where the two of us, when my wife Enola and I visited Holland and we linked up again with Hedda uh, she, uh, she made documentaries, and uh, quite frankly, she is a kick. Uh, but I'm certainly fortunate not to have ended up with her. She would have made mincemeat out of me. Um, my brother Tom in 1936 had entered an uh, agricultural school. It was obvious that uh, German kids didn't have a chance to uh, survive. And it 
was deemed that if you knew agriculture, you could get a job anywhere in this world. And so he uh, uh, spent three years in that agricultural school. And in 1939, as a matter of, as a, because of his agricultural training, he managed to come to the United States on a preferred quarter and uh, farmed for a while. When the war broke out, he joined the army. Uh, he was trained in Camp Ritchie uh, to be an interrogator of prisoners of war because, of course, he was fluent in German. And uh, in 19... Uh, just before the D-Day, the 82nd Airborne Division asked for more interrogators. And so he volunteered, and so his first jump was not a practice jump, but a jump into uh, Normandy, where the pilot was way off course because he was trying to avoid uh, anti-aircraft. And so my brother was captured. But fortunately, he was again liberated uh, 10 days later, and they never found out that he was a German Jew, or they would have killed him immediately. Uh, he then took part in the Battle of the Bulge later on, uh, liberated, helped liberate a concentration camp, Gribelin, um, where even long after the war, he stayed in touch, and where they now have a Werner T. Engels library. And after his death, death, a lot of his library went to Berlin. In In 1940, the Germans invaded Holland. Um, my brother and I, Fred, and I lived, uh, slept in one room, and one morning um, there was a lot of shooting going on outside. We, we first thought it was the Dutch army having uh, exercises, but then we went to the radio and found out that uh, no, the Germans had invaded Holland. Um, Initially, nothing much changed. The Germans hoped that the Dutch, whom they also considered Aryans, would join them in their conquest of the world. Well, the Dutch hated the Nazis, and they certainly didn't want to be occupied by the Germans. So um, after a year or so, the Germans started clamping down on the Dutch and especially on the Jewish population and started imposing more and more restrictions on both. In April 1941, my father was arrested. Again, according to German law, he was a criminal because he had to take his money out. So um, even so, they came one day to arrest him. He was not home. They said they would come back the next day. We could have gone into hiding at the time. My mother begged him to go into hiding. He had gone away for a while before. Uh, my father's attitude was he has caused the problems and he should pay for it. And my mother said, you know, you leave me with those two boys alone here. Um, but my father wouldn't budge and allowed himself to be arrested the next day. As long as he was in prison in Amsterdam, my mother could visit, her, visit him. Then he was transferred to prison in Berlin, and we still could exchange letters. But after his um, sentence was up, um, he was shipped to several concentration camps, finally to Auschwitz, where he perished uh, 10 days after he arrived there. Um, we only found out in 
1994, the day and the place that he died. In 1941, also, um, I had finished elementary school, and in uh, Holland at the time, elementary school was six years, and then you start high school, so it's the equivalent of junior high here. And um, I was, uh, my parents chose the uh, Jotz Lyceum, one of the Jewish high schools in Amsterdam. And uh, I was started there the same time that Anne Frank also started at the school. But we were on different tracks. The uh, schools in Europe are a little bit different, at least at that time. You had schools, high schools, ranging from two to seven years. And once you have changed, you chose your uh, direction you wanted to go in, you stayed with that group of kids all the way through. So Anna was on a different track than I was. She was on a, a seven-year track, and I was on a six-year track. Uh, but our rooms were adjacent, and I'm sure I rubbed elbows with her. I know we played volleyball against each other because that was the only recreation activity Jews were still, Jewish kids still were able to do. We were not allowed to swim or um, go to parks or anything of the sort. But we had intramural sports, and if I remember correctly, Anne was not the greatest volleyball player, but then she was a brainiac. Uh, there was a book written about our school uh, called Absent. And remarkably, come on, oh, that's good old Anna Frank. The class list somehow survived, and here you see that I was on the gymnasium track the first year and the second year, and here's Anne's first year class on the Lycée track. I just show this to prove that I'm not just blowing hot air. After war broke out, Hitler in 1941 decided that if, since he could not get rid of his Jews anymore by pushing them out of the country, that the final solution of the Jewish problem should be to kill the 11 million Jews living in Europe. And that took place in uh, a suburb of Berlin called Wannsee, uh, which I knew very well because on a parallel street to where this house was located was a home where my parents and I uh, vacationed several years. So I knew exactly where this was located. Uh, at that Wannsee conference um, gathered 15 men, uh, most of them PhDs and the rest of them high military officers. And um, it took him only 90 minutes to come up with the idea. I mean, I consider them sort of the equivalent of the uh, board of directors of Clark Pest Control. The only thing that their job was to figure out how to exterminate 11 million Jews instead of termites. After they... Uh, decided on the method of exterminating the uh, Jewish population through uh, mass killings and gas chambers. Uh, they went and had a good lunch.
the one they are, that house and the, the one they conference uh, was is now sort of a memorial you could might call it a museum um, where the Berlin students often visit to learn uh, what happened during the Nazi period and when my brother and my wife Inola and I visited Berlin in 1933, 1993. I was blown away that that picture that you showed earlier was there blown up. And I was blown away by this, and as was the director of the uh, uh, villa, because he, of course, didn't know me from Adam. And it just was a shock to me to find that picture there. Uh, going back to school, um, the first year at the Jewish school was fairly normal. I mean, uh, we were all Jewish teachers and Jewish kids, and uh, we uh, basically had normal instructions, but uh, the second year was much harder because that was uh, after the uh, deportation started. So when the, as a result of the uh, decision to send the Jewish population to extermination camp. The first in implementation of that was a uh, request to about 2,000 Jewish, German Jewish kids in Holland to uh, report for work in Germany. They were usually people, young people between the ages of 18 and 30. And probably the reason why the Germans decided, the Nazis decided uh, to zero in on German Jewish kids was because they felt that the Dutch general population would be less likely to object than if their own youth would be called. And they were correct in that assumption. Um, my brother got that call, as did two young women who lived with us. One was already an accomplished pianist who practiced every day for about five, six hours. And I still get chills running down my spine when I hear the pieces of Beethoven and Liszt and Chopin that she practiced. Anyhow, the two young women decided to go. One of them actually had married recently, and they took long uh, tennis rackets and sunglasses in the assumption that after the hours of work they could um, engage in the recreation. Also the older sister of Anne Frank got that call <coughs> and that's why the, when the Frank family went into hiding. My mother managed to get a job. I mean my mother was determined that my mother, brother was not going to go. And uh, she landed a job for him with the Jewish Council, the Yotzerat. And one of his jobs was to go along with the SS at night, rounding up his fellow Jews, carrying baggage or babies if necessary, and also to have a friendly face to make it easier for the SS to pick up their victims. You can imagine that that was not an easy task for my brother. Um, but my mother told him you absolutely had to do that in order to buy time. Thanks, Mom. Because he was still of use to the Germans, 
we, uh, not only he, but my mother and I got this stamp in our ID. And this was an ID, and there you see the J in the ID. Uh, I immediately identify you uh, as a Jew. And um, in 1941 also, I forgot to tell you that, we were required to wear this gem. And we had to wear this not only on our outerwear, but our, also on our uh, shirts inside any other place than inside your own home. So in class, we had to wear uh, this star. And if you were caught without this star and were stopped and you, they checked your ID, um, basically, uh, that was the end of you. We were sent to a concentration camp. Uh, initially, my brother's job was again to go along and uh, to the and escort people to the train to the uh, uh, camp in western part of Holland, where people would, from where people were sent then to the uh, extermination camp in Poland and eastern Germany. Then, there were about 800 of the 2,000 people who got the notice responded to the call to report for duty. And five months later, guess what? 800 less notices arrived. There was 100% fatality of those that had responded. And that should have been a wake-up call for the Jewish population in general. But unfortunately, uh, the Nazis were very clever, always giving people hope that they might escape. That prevented panic which was the only thing that might have saved more people. And in that way, they gained the cooperation of the uh, victims, basically. My mother read the Nazis correctly. Um, she was a survivor and did everything in her power to keep herself and her two boys out of the clutches of the Nazis. Unfortunately, she was the exception. Her advice to us boys was, if the Nazis ever get a hold of you, run at the first sight, at the first opportunity. The worst that can happen to you is that they kill you by shooting you. And believe me, that is better than what you will find at the end of that train ride that they want to put you on and how right she was. Uh, my brother's job later on, initially they uh, rounded up people and put them immediately on the train. Later on, that was too complicated. And that is, they converted a theater into a holding pen, basically, and collected people um, all week long and there were kids of the Jewish council who catered to the people who were kept prisoners there, of course, under the uh, watchful eyes of the SS. But basically, all the tasks, the registration and counting and uh, taking care of other needs of the people in that uh, uh, theater was kept uh, done by the... Uh, Jewish kids. And the babies were kept across the street in a nursery and where they were taken care of by some young Jewish uh, woman. And one fellow of the Jewish council, uh, Walter Ziskind, decided he was going to try to save as many as he could. 
and he approached the parents who had babies across the street and asked them, are you willing to give up your baby to, for safekeeping? And if they agreed to that, and these were mainly uh, Dutch uh, uh, university students, uh, they took those babies and uh, found home for them either the northern or the southern part of Holland, usually not in Amsterdam. Um, there were about six of the uh, Jewish kids from the Yotzerat who collaborated. And you can imagine what kind of a decision that was for the parents to give their kids up to somebody totally unknown for safekeeping. We don't know exactly how many babies were saved that way. The estimate is at least 600 and it's maybe as many as 2,000. So you have to weigh what my brother, on the one hand, he, would, he, he helped the Nazis round up his fellow Jews. On the other hand, he helped uh, Jews to escape from the Trauberg, from the theater. They also helped adults out. Uh, not as many, probably as, possibly as many as 600. And um, uh, that was uh, by distracting the SS men. There was one uh, German, the Walter Süßkind, he just uh, he knew the, he was a German Jew who knew the Germans very well and knew how to communicate with the SS men. And while he was communicating, they smuggled some people out, not very many, but some. Also, possibly as many as 600. And interesting enough, there was also one SS man, I can't think of his name right now, who actually knew what was happening and just simply turned his back when they were uh, smuggling people out. So there even were SS people with the conscience. He was later on nominated uh, to be honored by Yad Vashem. And uh, then there was a lot of people that objected to that, and he never got that honor. But after he died, some of the people who he helped rescue uh, wrote an obituary for him, uh, again basically thanking him for saving their lives. So, uh, of course, the, when the day came for people to be uh, shipped out of the theater to the train, uh, a count had to be made. So the mothers who were going to be reunited with their babies either had their baby in, in, in their hands or a blanket fashioned in such a way that it looked like there was a baby in there. So that's how they made up with that count. Um, and they also knew how many adults they were smuggled out. And it was a Jewish kid that did the counting. And they let them know how many people were smuggled out. So if 10 people were smuggled out, he counted 68, 69, 90, 91, 92. He just skipped and he did this very fast and uh, was never caught at that. And probably one reason why, uh, why he was not caught is because Jews were deemed to be cowards. And it never occurred to the Nazis uh, that Jews would uh, resist them in this way. I will share with you some uh, close escapes uh, that I had, or that my family had. Um, usually they went, when they rounded up people, and they rounded up about, in one year's time, they pretty much eliminated the Jewish population in Holland. It was 140,000 to begin with. Uh, 28,000 of which went into hiding, 
of which 16,000 survived. Of those, um, about 120,000 who did not go into hiding, uh, only 5,000 survived. So obviously, your chances were survi of survival was much higher if you went into hiding. The unfortunate part was, of course, that the Jewish council advised the Jewish population to co cooperate with the uh, Germans rather than uh, fight them. Because if you were caught in hiding, uh, the story went, you would be punished more than otherwise. Well, you would end up either way. But of course, that was not known. Um, but unfortunately, I think uh, if it would have been uh, wonderful if more people would have gone into hiding, even so going into hiding was also, uh, it is not just a decision to go into hiding. You had a, um, you had to wear the risk of going into hiding because you were told that it was worse if you were caught in hiding than if you were caught just being a Jew. The interesting part is that after the war, they found out that more people, a greater percentage of people that went into hiding and were caught survived than if you were caught, uh, rounded up just being a Jew. And my theory is if you were caught uh, having gone into hiding, you were deemed to be a criminal and were treated as such and still deemed a human being. Well, if you were rounded up strictly by as being a Jew, um, you were a subhuman. I mean, that's just a theory that I have, but uh, it may be right and it may not be right. One day, the Nazis decided to have a razzia of the Clio Street just going from house to house in one street. They, and they, of all places, picked the uh, street where we lived. It was the Clio Street. And uh, this is the apartment where we lived, and the drapes that we had at the time were much heavier than the ones that are there now. Um, one could look out, but basically one could not look in. And um, I, of course, knew that um, there was something going on in our street, and I watched them getting closer and closer. Now, my mother was home, and a friend of her was home. And finally, uh, an SS man was standing where I am here, standing in 1993, and rang our doorbell. And I was standing behind the curtains here, and it was looking like looking death into its face. And then I remembered to run. And I, that was one point, one time that my mother was sort of paralyzed. Her friend was heavy set, and I mean, he just couldn't run. And so I grabbed my mother, and I didn't know whether she would follow me or not. But luckily, she did. And we went out the back porch, went over that little wall, and uh, ran across, uh, which, of course, was a different street, and again, crossed this little wall and entered the door, which was uh, fortunately opened. And we were not more than half a minute or a minute inside over here with the door closed when the SS men appeared on our neighbor's back porch and entered our apartment uh, through the back door. Had I and my mother hesitated for less than a minute, I wouldn't be here today. That was one close escape. Another close escape was 
then my brother who worked for the Jewish Council and who was in fairly close contact with the SS. He usually knew what was going on. And one morning there was a lot of activity and he said, you know, he told my mother and me, you know you better take shelter in the office where I work of the Jew. And this was, it's basically an apartment building, but it was used as an office at the time. And he thought that the SS would leave that alone uh, because uh, the people of the Jewish Council were slowly of use to the Nazis. Um, so we went over there, and uh, lo and behold, the SS came, entered that building. So they would not leave it alone. Uh, they assumed that people would look for shelter there. And as soon as they came in, my brother, who uh, he wore an armband, which uh, identify him as one of the Jewish council, uh, he asked two of his buddy to take me upstairs into the attic room and put a chair on the table uh, and so that I could open the uh, trap door to the attic, which they did. So I, I went up, climbed on the table and the chair, opened the trap door, closed it, and was up in the attic then. And I got the scare of my life when the trap door opened, but fortunately there was only another kid coming over to join me up there. And while up there, I mean, the attic had no floor. It was just the beams, and then below was glass and plaster. They didn't have uh, sheetrock at the time. And uh, nature called. And plaster is pretty poor stuff. And I did not want to lose my life with a yellow stain in the ceiling. I mean, I could just could be as, as, oh, what have we got there? And looked around, and lo and behold, I found an empty wine bottle. And, well, it might be still up there, vintage of 1943. What happened down below? Of course, I was sweating it out up there. I knew the SS was down below, as was my brother and my mother. Not a, not a good combination. And I was contemplating, what am I going to do if they haul them off? I knew where they would be taken to. Should I join them? I knew that my mother would be furious if I did that. So I sort of made up my mind to go to Christian friends that we had and ask them to uh, shelter me. What happened down below in the meantime is that they, uh, the SS rounded up everybody that they could find in the building, put them on one side of a large room, and had then got the list from the Jewish council of the people who were working there. And they called off the names. Now my brother and my mother must have communicated somewhat. My brother simply managed to slip out of that room. And in a way he could do that because he was identified as belonging to the Jewish council. And so as I called off the names of the people who worked there, they came to the name of Angres and simply said Angres. And my mother went across instead of my brother. And that's how they survived that day. I mean, you had to be fast on your feet, but somehow my mother and my brother must have communicated. And um, the people that were left over uh, were hauled off, and I doubt whether any of them survived. Um, then one day my brother came home and there were only less than a thousand Jews left in Amsterdam and we were also concentrated. We had to, uh, early in that year, we also had to move to basically what amounted to a ghetto in Amsterdam. So it was really easy for the Nazis to round up the few remaining Jews in Amsterdam. And then my brother came home with us, basically, he said there's a lot of activity and only a few of us left. Uh, tonight they are going to round up the rest and then they can declare Holland Judenrein, uh, free of Jews. 
Um, fortunately, my mother had prepared for that eventuality and she ordered the taxi. How she managed to do that is beyond me because there were only two taxis in Amsterdam. There was hardly any gas, but she managed and it took us to a uh, um, apartment near where we used to live in the Kleostrat, which belonged to a German non-Jewish woman who was uh, running a, a sweatshop there. Uh, there was a room full of sewing machines and bags of fur. And women were making fur caps and gloves for the uh, soldiers on the Eastern Front. And the woman locked us into that room, gave us a potty and some water, and told us we had to be absolutely quiet because that night her boyfriend was coming. And guess what? He was a Nazi. So here was the idiotic situation. The German woman with a Nazi boyfriend hit three Jews in, the, in her apartment. Well, we stayed there for one night, and we heard her boyfriend come night and leave in the morning and after he left the three of us left and um, at that point the Dutch resistance sort of had taken over our destiny and my brother my mother and I went into different directions and we did not see each other or communicate with each other for the next 18 months there were people that knew where we all were, but they did not want us to know from each other because if any one of us was caught, the Nazis used terror in order uh, to get information out of you. They tortured you, and you didn't know how much torture you could withstand. So we did not want to know from each other either. Um, after that first night, I ended up with another German lady who lived in a boarding house, uh, which was run by two very uh, uh, devout Christian ladies. And I felt reasonably uh, safe there, but a boarding house was not exactly a good place to be hiding. And they told me they were looking for a permanent place for me, which I finally found. And one day, um, I was told that I was being picked up by Mr. Cui. Um, uh, this is Mr. Cui at the time. Um, and we walked across the city uh, to where they lived in the western part of the count, uh, country. And this apartment is where I left. I spent the next 18 months. And those 18 months were really, for me, a very exciting time. The uh, Kui family, there were uh, uh, Mr. Kui, Ton Kui, his wife, Alida Kui, Ali Kui, and the two boys, Walter and Peter. And um, it was a two-bedroom apartment, and the... Uh, um, boys' room had only room for two beds. So those two boys, four and six years old at the time, had to sleep toe-to-toe -to -toe in a narrow one-person bed for the period of 18 months. So not only was it a, a, this they risked their life to save me, but it was also a, a real inconvenience for the children. Uh, the Khoi's, in the meantime, were involved in all kinds of activity, uh, illegal uh, resistance activity. For instance, they, uh, one had to provide, the Dutch resistance had to provide food and uh, textile coupons for people. And people were in hiding. Uh, unless you had access to coupons, you had to buy your food on the black market. And that was about at least 10 times as much as normal. So a pound of butter was $60. Um, so you either had to be wealthy or you had to ex have access to coupons. And besides the Jewish people in hiding in Holland, there were many, actually way more Dutch uh, young men in hiding 
because many of those we have ordered to <coughs> work in Germany, and then rather than doing that, they went into hiding. But once they went into hiding, again, they had no access to coupons anymore. And so the Dutch resistance had to raid a distribution center every month to come up with 100,000 or so food coupons. You got new coupons every month for bed, bread, butter, uh, cheese, and, and uh, cigarettes, and candy, uh, and also for clothing and shoes, and so forth. And uh, those coupons then had to be distributed to the different resistance groups. The Dutch resistance was not one large organization. There were the Catholics and the Protestants and the Socialists and the Communists and you name what. I mean, and all these organizations worked together until about three months before the end of the war when they all started struggling for power again. And the thing fell apart, but by that time it didn't matter anymore. Um, so there were lots of activities. People, uh, uh, we got whole stacks of coupons that were, that they had uh, basically uh, raided uh, for distribution. And I spent a lot of time cutting bread coupons and uh, pasted them on sheets uh, for further distribution or for uh, to go to merchants and buy large quantities of bread who basically knew what you were doing and were helping in that effort to uh, feed people in hiding. And uh, the Dutch also uh, gathered information to uh, be relayed to the uh, Allied. And Mr. Kui, uh, uh, towards the end of the war, there was also a curfew. Uh, nobody was allowed on the street between 8 at night and 6 in the morning. And uh, Mr. Koi had a brother who was a fireman, and he got injured, but kept his uniform. And he gave the uniform to Tom Koi, who then had the freedom at night, because you, know, you could not restrict firemen from being on the street at night. So, and the Germans had a healthy uh, respect for uniforms anyhow. So, um, if there was work to be done at night, um, he did that in his uh, uh, fireman's uniform. And one day he was on the street in daytime, and there was a fire, and the lady screamed out the window, saw him in his uniform, and he went up and put out the fire <laughs> before the fire engine arrived, because that would have caused trouble. Um, the, I, uh, in order, to, you know, there was always a chance that you were going to be betrayed. And um, the Kui family were the only ones that were active there. But I'm almost sure that all these people are living on the staircase knew exactly what was going on. They didn't believe the story um, that I was a orphan from Rotterdam. Uh, you know, they took my ID, they took the J out, they changed my name from Un Angres to Andreas, so they only had to change two letters. They were real artists doing that work. What was more complicated to change my birthplace from Berlin to Rotterdam. And the reason why so many people in hiding were, had addresses from Rotterdam, because the Germans bombed Rotterdam when they invaded Holland and destroyed the... Uh, city hall with all the documents. So it was impossible to trace uh, these addresses. So there, there are lots of people in hiding from Rotterdam. And you know, these people nowadays we call bystanders. They would not help you, but they would not betray you either. And so I'm very reluctant when people say that the bystanders are necessarily bad people. No. Some of them are. I mean, then, for instance, in that case where a girl was being raped and there were lots of students standing around doing nothing, that are bystanders that are evil. But bystanders who are not willing to risk their and their family's life to 
shelter somebody else, um, I cannot consider these necessarily these to be bad people, but they're, they're simply not heroes in my book. So like I say, my, uh, my time in hiding was really high. Fortunately, they had a good library, so I spent a lot of time reading. I also spent time making like little flags. I made a flag for each American division on a, on a pin. The flags were about half an inch by an inch, and I managed to get the 13 stripes and the blue field with 48 white dots on them on both sides. And that kept me busy. And not only the Americans' divisions, but for the British division, the Canadian division, the uh, Russian divisions. And we had a big map on the wall. And we listened, of course, to the BBC, which was strictly forbidden. You were not even allowed to own a uh, radio that could, could receive the BBC. And it was my job often to listen to, uh, to the radio. Again, I had most free time. Uh, I was 16 years old at the time, and uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, mandatory age in school age in Holland is 16, so um, it was not suspicious that I didn't go to school. So I, off, I at times went out on the street and um, to get some fresh air. I had my good ID with me. And uh, that way, I uh, felt reasonably safe going outside. But I couldn't go to school because in Dutch, I have as much of an accent as in English. And my birthplace of Rotterdam and my accent just um, wouldn't do. Um, <clears throat> in order to um, prepare for a possible a chance of being betrayed, uh, they made a hiding place for me in the dining room under the uh, dining table. You could fold the uh, carpet back and Mr. Cui cut a, a small section out of the floor and put a board on the uh, ceiling down below it. Again, it was lath and plaster, so uh, it needed the board to distribute my weight so that I didn't up on the dining room table of the lady below. And one day, they wanted to see how long, A, the, they went downstairs to ring, somebody rang downstairs the bell and came up and wanted to see that I actually, in that period of time that somebody came up, could end up under the table. And uh, actually, it, it took less than half a minute for me to get down there. And they wanted to see how long I could last in there and gave me a bottle of water. And um, there I was on my belly in, in cramped space. And I found a bolt and something and started twirling. I didn't think anything of it. And the next day, the lady from down below came up to talk to Mrs. Cooey and said, but Mrs. Cooey, guess what? Last night, I was in my living room. And all of a sudden, my hanging pants started twirling and twirling and twirling. <laughs> I had gotten a hold of a hanging plant. And, and the message basically was, better be careful with what you're doing. Um, the, uh, I told you before that they had to get a hold of um, coupons every month to be distributed. And in order to do that, you needed the gun. I mean, you had to somehow force your way into those distribution places. And in Holland, the guns are not as prevalent, and you were not allowed to own a gun anyhow. But the Dutch resistance had a certain amount of guns. But in order to do these raids on this distribution center, the gun had to be hauled from one place to the other. You obviously couldn't hit the same place every time. 
and the father of Mrs. Cui decided that he was going to, he should do the more dangerous job of hauling that gun around. And one day he was uh, put the gun with his, uh, in his satchel and was on the train to haul it from one place to another. And the Nazis came through the train and checked everybody's luggage. Now they were not uh, looking for guns and ammunition. What they were looking for was bread and butter and eggs that the population had gone into the farmers and illegally bought. Uh, this was not allowed. This was black market. And the uh, Nazis were trying to confiscate that uh, um, what they had gathered. And so they came to Grandpa Laro, and he was a short, sweet-looking, retired merchant marine with baby blue eyes. And they asked him, well, Grandpa, what have you got in your satchel? And he looked up at them and said, it's uh, guns and ammunition. <laughs> and they looked at him and said, oh, you joker, and went on. Of course, he was trained to do that. The last thing the Germans wanted to do was look ridiculous. And so what they expected is that they opened the satchel and out would drop his long johns and his PJs and his toothbrush. And everybody would the train would la be laughing and they would be looking ridiculous. So they were not willing to take that chance. And um, Obelaro did that many a time and he survived. But this was the only time that they actually came to check his luggage. One day I was outside. That was pretty much late in the day. Then they allowed me to run some of the errands uh, to help distribute food coupons and sometimes uh, also actual food. And one day I was hauling a wheel of cheese. And that was like gold. Again, it was to be distributed to people in hiding. And I had bought that wheel. I had delivered it. And on my way home, I ran into my former Cub Scout leader. And I knew that she had turned Nazi. And we recognized each other. And I had to, I hesitated for a minute and uh, decided to take the bull by the horns and go up to her. And I knew her by the name of Bajira. And I said, I guess, Bajira, you know, you realize that I am in hiding. And I would appreciate if you would not betray me. And we were actually pretty good buddies. And she was a Boy Scout leader. She got along well. And um, she told me, of course not. And we chatted for a while. And then we parted ways. I made sure that I didn't go straight home and made uh, sure that she wasn't following me. But that was certainly a scary moment. This is again the Ali and Ton Kui. Many years later, I helped them come to the United States. And uh, uh, this is in uh, Alamo, uh, here in uh, the East Bay, where they lived many years. Um, when the evasion took place, I was spending the entire day on the radio hoping and praying for the, that the Allies were, may succeed. And uh, it was one of the most exciting days of my days in hiding, uh, June 6, 1944. Amsterdam was on the flight path from Germany to Berlin. And so often there were thousands of planes coming overhead. They usually came in waves of about 100 planes. And then there was a period of rest. And then they came in other 100 planes. And Anne Frank, in her book, she was scared on the, of those planes. And for me, it was music to my ears. And uh, again, I uh, 
my thoughts were with those guys, and my, I knew that my survival may depend on the success of those American pilots in their B-17s and B-24s. Uh, one day, uh, one plane was disabled. The uh, engines had stopped, and it came gliding down, and the crew was bailing out. And it looked like it was straight, heading straight uh, for me. I was standing in front of the window, and I was wondering whether I should move. But then I figured out if I move, it might end up where I moved to. So I might as well stay where I am. And uh, the plane uh, started coming and then started rearing away. And I saw a cloud of smoke where it crashed. Fortunately, it crashed in the street. It killed one street window, but it could have been a lot worse. In the meantime, the people I found out again, because uh, the crews were in the underground, that uh, all the pilots, all the crew made it down all right. Even though I was horrified, the Germans were shooting at them and hope they didn't hit the uh, uh, crew, but they hit the uh, parachutes. And so you saw the parachutes getting holes in them, but they made it down all right. Half of them actually were captured by the Germans and they came down. And the other half, the Dutch underground got a hold of them before the Germans could. And they took them and uh, they had ways of getting them through France to uh, Portugal and back to England to fly again. So that was again one of the activity of the Dutch underground. Uh, this is a cooking contraption which I will no come back. My mother, in the meantime, went into hiding in the boarding house where we first lived when we came to Holland. Uh, I don't know exactly how many months till we uh, uh, moved into an apartment. And that boarding house was taken over by the German military. And she lived in one of these attic rooms and paraded as the maid, used her maiden name, and made the officer's bed, and cleaned their rooms, and I suspect flirted with them. And she also managed to get her nails done once a week and her hair done. My mother had her priorities. And that's how she spent in hiding. Again, um, since Jews were deemed to be cowards, it never occurred to the Germans that she might be a Jewish woman in hiding. Uh, in the northern part of Holland, we were really never liberated. The war simply ended. And so on May 8th, the war was over. The Germans were still there. They are carrying their guns. But we weren't afraid of them anymore. Um, it was a strange situation. I mean, it, uh, that was about for three, four days. And then we are told the Canadians were coming. And I wanted to see those guys come in. And uh, the coys were busy, so I went by myself. Uh, uh, we were told which route they were going to take to come in. And there were, of course, thousands of people waiting there. And uh, finally, I saw some activity in the distance. And as it came closer, leading the parade was a tall, good-looking black dude on a Harley Davidson. And to this day, this dude on his Harley, with his big smile on his face, is my symbol of freedom. When I saw him, the war was over. And uh, it gave me sort of a closure. Um, 
my father, my brother, of course, didn't know anything where we were, and nor, nor did we know that he was uh, a soldier. And so a few days after the war, my brother, he had he gotten permission from his commanding general, Jim Gavin, which I called Slim Jim, uh, to uh, go look for his family. And uh, there was another soldier who also uh, had family in Holland, and the two of them came to Amsterdam and arrived on Mother's Day in 1945. So it was probably the best Mother's Day my mother ever experienced. And so the three of us were uh, reunited. My mother, my brother was basically went to the last home um, where we lived that he knew of and we had told us we expected him or my father to go to that home. So we had told those people and they cooperated uh, getting us in touch with each other. Uh, my father did not return. Um, Uh, in 1997, um, I managed to, uh, uh, my oldest brother, who was a historian basically, managed to get a hold of his death certificate and it noticed, noticed that it was, that he died of sudden heart stoppage. Now that language sounded strange to me. I mean, why didn't they say heart attack? Uh, which I wrote on all the other death notices that went earlier. Uh, the uh, death notice was signed by Dr. Bruno Kett. And when I doc Googled Dr. Kett, I found out that one of his, his job was to select those in the camp Auschwitz, in the work camp. Auschwitz was not uh, entirely an extermination camp, but also a work camp. So my father, when he arrived in Auschwitz, did not end up in the gas chamber, but uh, in the work camp. But 10 days later, he was selected by Dr. Kitt uh, as being too weak to be of any use to the German war machine. And after, once you were selected, you were ordered to go to a doctor's office where an orderly injected phenol directly into the heart which stopped the heart almost immediately. And that explained this term, sudden heart stoppage, to me. Of course, the death certificate was never meant to be uh, uh, for distribution to relatives, uh, but simply for the German uh, bookkeeping. So they didn't, uh, certain heart stoppages, the Germans knew exactly what that meant. Um, it must have been an easier death for my father than having to grasp for air for 15 minutes in the gas chamber crowded with hundreds of others. Dr. Kidd is an example of how good people can be made to do terrible things. He was raised a Catholic. His father was a uh, principal of a Catholic school. He had a medical practice in a small mining town in Germany before the war and was well liked. While still in Auschwitz, he was married in 1944 by a priest to a Catholic woman. He had a son a year later who was baptized. And after Auschwitz was evacuated because the Russians were approaching, he became a tank a camp doctor at the concentration camp Neuengamen near Hamburg. While there, he committed enough atrocities during the last two months of the war that the British tribunal, after lengthy trial, sentenced him to death on May 3, 1946. His killings in Auschwitz were not even part of the trial. He claimed that in Auschwitz he was a doctor for the SS guards only. Well, it's like my father's death certificate. And my father was not an SS man. Who knows how this man justified his actions? 
What was he thinking? Or was he thinking at all? Did he consider himself merely a good soldier by carrying out the atrocities expected of him by the Nazi leadership? There is a fine line between being an obedient soldier and being a perpetrator of terrible evil deeds. Without the Nazis, Dr. Kidd probably would have been a decent human being and might have been a good husband and father and probably a good doctor. One has to ponder how his wife, Clara, and his son managed to deal with all this after his death. It gives me no comfort that Dr. Kidd was executed on October 8, 1946. He got a lot of letters from uh, clergy and former uh, uh, friends of his. And that was a dangerous thing to do in those days because uh, those letters were written after he was sentenced to death. And if you write a letter in, uh, of trying to save somebody who was sentenced to death, you were automatically uh, suspected of being also a Nazi. So these people were probably sincere in considering that Dr. Kidd was a good guy. Now that the war was over, I found myself on my own at age 17. My, brother, my mother was in no position to support me, and I did not see much of a future for me in Holland. When my oldest brother Tom offered to help my brother Fred and me to get to the United States, we jumped at that opportunity. When I got to the U.S. with $25 in my pocket, I first finished high school in a private school in Lenox, Massachusetts, which was run by a friend of my brother. I then took a job on a dairy farm in Connecticut. When I got an offer for a position on a dairy in Marin County, I decided to go west. I became a partner in a dairy operation on Tomales Bay. The partnership lasted for 20 years now still known as the Strauss family farm. After that, I became a real estate broker, first doing sales and later on many property management. I didn't like particularly the sales aspect. I have been married twice. I have six children for my first marriage, 12 grandkids and one of the, on the way in Jakarta, in the nature of all places, and have eight great grandkids. My second wife, Enola, and I have been married for 35 years. She helped me raise my two youngest children. I am often asked why I do not, do not seem angry. The answer is that I was angry at first about what happened to me growing up, but I also was numb. Caring mainly for cows for 20 years just after the war allowed me not to have to deal with my anger. Ultimately, with supporting from Enola, I got counseling and was made to realize that anger is a waste of energy and instead channel my efforts into matters that are productive. Speaking to students like you also has helped me get rid of anger because of hope that by sharing my story, I can urge young people to choose a positive path in life, not a destructive one. So what might you learn from a Jewish kid who grew up in Nazi Germany? The inhumanity of people towards each other continues to this day. The Nazis just put a new twist to it. When evil people come to power, apparently it is easy for them to convince perfectly decent people to commit horrendous acts. Intelligent evil people in leading positions are a lot more dangerous than dumb ones. Dumb ones are mere, merely obnoxious. Bright ones are deadly. When finding yourself the target of persecution, it is important to be realistic to recognize the danger and try to save yourself, as did my mother, but far too few of my fellow Jews did. Realize that few people are heroes, willing to risk their life to save others. Ask yourself what would you do if a complete stranger facing an unknown danger would ask you for help? Would you risk you and your family's life as Ali and Tom Cui did to shelter me from the Nazis? I am hopeful for the future, but there is work to be done, and I am afraid that much of it is up to you, because my generation has failed to deal with the many of the long-term problems humankind faces. Some of you will enter the field of politics, 
And I hope that when you do, you will deal seriously with problems of a growing world population, dwindling resources, all kinds of pollution, global warming, declining job opportunities, among others. Don't ask, what can I do as an individual? You can perform an act of kindness, help someone in need. Arthur Ashe, the tennis player, once said, start where you are now, use what you have, do what you can. Above all, pay attention, think, and don't just follow the leaders as so many Germans did. And please treat others the way you want to be treated. This is the last of this year's Holocaust and Genocide lecture series. I want to take this opportunity to thank all those, especially uh, professors Parnell and Goodman, who have had a hand in putting together this really remarkable series. I hope that my talk, talk today somehow complements the lectures that have gone before. I wish you guys strength, good luck, and a better world. Thank you, thank you. Any questions? I knew that question would come up. <laughs> uh, he had some medals from the First World War in his pocket, and I assume a good chunk of money. And I think he paid the guy off, which he could not have done if there were three people there. If there, if there were to have been uh, witnesses, uh, he could not have done that. But he basically bribed the guy. And I'm convinced that if he, if he would have found the three of us, that could not have been done, could not have worked. Good. But unfortunately, he did not survive the war either. But that, all, that question always comes up. Well, they both, yeah. It's in English. It's 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 available on uh, uh, on Amazon. What is it called? I yeah, it's uh, it is a good read actually. The beginning is a little bit hard. There's a lot of family in the beginning, uh, but the rest of the book is pretty exciting. Well, my father made an arrangement with a, I mean, we were not, we had to give up the store. And uh, rather than taking money, we asked the people to give us a monthly stipend to help us through the war. And I don't know, I'm, I assume that the people where I was in hiding got a few, few dollars each month for me. I mean, they were a blue-collar uh, family with a very limited income. So I assume that uh, some of that money went. Uh, so th my father had made arrangements, but that money stopped as soon as the war was over. But it certainly helped my mother and the three of us uh, make it through the hiding period.
the question is, uh, did my mother advise uh, to run whether I fully uh, realized what that meant? Yes, I certainly did. Um, you grew up fast in those days. Pardon? Um, to re yes, I mean, like I say, at 17 years old, I was on my own. Oh, yes, we visited each other. My mother remarried after the war. Uh, she did not want to be a burden. It was a marriage of convenience, but it worked out pretty well for both of them. And uh, uh, she moved, uh, uh, her second husband lived in London and had a, a raincoat factory, Delbury Coats Limited. And uh, yeah, she came to visit us, and uh, I visited her in uh, London. And towards the end of her life, after her husband had died, uh, she actually had this stroke and my brother and I, my oldest brother and I picked her up and brought her to uh, uh, this country and uh, she lived in Petaluma for a while. Then she died at the age of 92. The last couple of years were hard for her because the stroke has kept her pretty incapacitated. Thank you.